Our next speaker is Dr. Asad Ahmed. Uh, he is uh, Associate Professor of Arabic and Islamic Studies in the Department of Near Eastern Studies at the University of California, Berkeley. Dr. Ahmed specializes in early Islamic social history and pre-modern Islamic intellectual history with a special focus on the rationalist disciplines such as philosophy, logic, and astronomy. His current focus is the period era 1200 to 1900 um, CE, especially with reference to the Indian subcontinent. He's the author of The Religious Elite of the Early Islamic Hijaz and Avicenna, De Avicenna's Deliverance, Logic. Please welcome Dr. Asad Ahmed. for inviting me, Salman. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I've enjoyed uh, my few hours here so far. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, all right. So, Professor Saliba's work is very tough to follow on because it's uh, so utterly enlightening and, and so well presented with all the details. Am I, I'm not going to be presenting a slideshow. In fact, I th thought last night after I arrived here, I'd been thinking about what I would say, but I thought about what um, I would say more concretely, and I took some notes on my hotel <laughs> papers. Uh, and uh, I think what I will do here is I'm going to tackle, I'm going to ta tackle two issues. One of them is going to be about, uh, I, you know, both of the issues will, will, will pertain to, to, to how we theoretically grasp the question of science and progress and innovation in the Islamic tradition. So I'm not going to be giving the kinds of details that were given to you just now. Uh, some of, there will be some details from my own work, but um, I'm, I'm more interested in the question of framing and theory. And in this regard, there are, when it comes to the question of Islam and science, I want to address two topics. Uh, one is that in talking about this issue, we have to think about, uh, not about the question of what Muslims did in science, but how they did science. So it was going to be some of my comments are going to pertain to commentaries and glosses and how scientific knowledge was produced. Uh, this mode of knowledge production is very different from the modes that we employ today. And so the question of authorship, genre, originality, and so on, and how they are to be understood within the context of pre-modern scientific development uh, has to be put on the floor. Uh, so that's one of the things I'll talk about. And the second thing I'll talk about is uh, a related topic, uh, and it is uh, what is it that we consider to be science? in the pre-modern world. Uh, you know, we, we talk about astronomy and biology, uh, in other words, other kinds of sciences that are acknowledged as science today. Uh, but in the pre-modern world, uh, what is considered science is much more complex. Um, the different disciplines are interconnected and then form each other. The premises of one discipline uh, inform uh, uh, and stand as the starting points of another discipline and so on. So those are the two topics I want to talk about. Uh, once again, the first one is an issue of how science was done in the pre-modern Islamic world. Uh, and the second question is one of what science is, what should we be talking about really? In addition, of course, to astronomy and medicine and other things that we recognize as science today. Uh, so in the pre-modern Islamic world, the various disciplines uh, are utterly interconnected. And this is something that we know, of course, already from the work of uh, scholars and philosophers like Aristotle. Uh, the, there is a larger organic scientific enterprise where uh, physics, metaphysics, and logic and other disciplines contribute to each other in meaningful ways. And uh, this kind of interconnectivity among the sciences for the Muslims becomes even more pronounced after the 13th century, the time when the famous madrasa uh, textbooks were written. Uh, of course, there are other textbooks of the madrasa tradition that were written after, after that, but the 13th century is an especially fecund period when texts on logic and astronomy and so on were produced, including, of course, Tusi in the 13th century that Professor Saliba just spoke about. So this production of the various disciplines in the 13th century and the fact that the scholars who came after read all of these disciplines, ranging from, of course, the Quranic exegesis to Hadith, to astronomy, to logic, to medicine, and so on, uh, 
And for them, this was a world, world of disciplines that are utterly interconnected. One of them informs another and so on. In fact, I don't think they think through disciplinary boundaries very clearly. Uh, so that's something I'm going to talk about in just a second. So to keep it, I want to keep in mind, I want you to keep in mind this idea that there's a very, very intricate and sophisticated interconnectedness among the various so-called disciplines in the pre-modern scientific enterprise. Uh, by the time we get to the period I'm talking about, namely the post-classical period from the 13th century onwards, uh, the main canons of scientific production in Islam, the main theories, have been laid down. What's going to happen after this period is that through the commentaries and glosses and new texts, these theories are going to be challenged. Uh, they're going to be reconsidered. New economic proofs are, going, are going to be given for earlier proofs. Um, errors are going to be found, and so on and so forth. In other words, a certain canon in the classical period that has been set down, the new tradition comes around the 13th century and then is going to keep flowering by a sophisticated en engagement in commentaries and glosses. Uh, and it's going to be an interconnected uh, engagement. And by the way, uh, once again to stress my point, when we talk about science or even the rationalist sciences, uh, we should not forget the point that even sciences that are not considered rationalist, such as sciences in the service of religion, such as legal theory, even those sciences are going to be informed by the rationalist tradition, by traditions of logic and astronomy and so on. Uh, even theological texts, famous ones that are even read today, such as the Mawakif of Iji, have sections on astronomy embedded within them. In other words, it's a very complex tradition uh, uh, that is very distinct from the one we, that, you know, that allows us to think about science today. So let's keep that in mind. Uh, the, uh, all right, a couple of other things I want to point out. So now that you have, that, now that you have some sense of the idea that, that the sciences, the different disciplines are connected with each other, I also want to uh, share with you a point uh, that is very important to me, namely that the disciplines are connected with each other through a certain kind of directionality. So for example, astronomy, al al in the Islamic tradition, informs in many ways astrological works. The impact on the other, the other way is more limited. Logic seems to inform legal theory. Legal theory does not seem to inform logic as much. So there's a certain kind of propedeutic to the sciences, a certain kind of hierarchy. This hierarchy, which is in the service of instruction, is supposed to reflect the actual nature of how sciences are related to each other. And that relation of the sciences and the hierarchical uh, uh, a strand uh, and this uh, pedagogical hierarchy of the sciences also in many ways reflects the ways according to pre-modern Muslim traditions how human beings learn about things. So you go from things that are known to th things that are unknown. You go for example from the study of logic and grammar which gives you the basics of understanding language and parsing it and how to think logically to the next step of things that pertain uh, for example to the uh, sublunar world, to physics and from there, you get certain conclusions and premises which might inform your metaphysical enterprises. So there is a certain hierarchy of the sciences. Assumptions of one science inform another. Astronomy, for example, the way it was developing in the Islamic tradition, in Islamic civilization, was in many ways also struggling with trying to find suitable um, hypotheses that would be able to work with certain cosmological arguments that were presented in the falsafa or philosophy tradition. In other words, there are one tradition or one set of disciplines mind, mind, mindful of the limitations also of another discipline. So these are some of the things to keep in mind. And the reason I've gone into this long discussion about the question of disciplines is that when the question is asked about what is it that Muslims contributed, let's say, to science, the question is not to be limited just to astronomy or medicine. The question has to be expanded into fields of legal theory. It also has to be expanded into fields of logic, which is, by the way, one of the main things that I work on. Uh, Pre-modern Muslim logic uh, is a discipline that develops in the service as a tool for the other sciences, but over time, especially after the 13th century, it becomes a self-reflective and introspective discipline that begins to think about its own premises and the paradoxes of the various propositions within the system. In other words, it becomes an object of study itself, a scientific object. So all these things have to be kept in mind. The interconnectivity uh, of the disciplines, the hierarchical structure of the disciplines, how that relates to the modes of instructions within a madrasa context, and how ultimately that reflects how human beings learn, what kind of entities they are within the larger cosmos. These are interconnected things. So this is the first point I wanted to make among the two that I outlined or mentioned early on. Uh, namely, we have to think about the question of science and what science 
is in a very specific way in the Muslim context. The other thing I, I want to mention is the question of, uh, uh, of how this science was done. And this brings us back to what Professor Saliba began to talk about in, in the early parts of his talk. Uh, Muslim uh, scientific discourse in the post-classical period, again from the 13th century onward, most of it occurs in the context of commentaries and glosses. So you have, for example, a main text, a mutton, you, you can call it a base text, and it is written, let's say, as a textbook. Now these textbooks are very, very interesting because they're very pithy and they are elusive. So for example, you would have one <coughs> phrase where a matin or you know, base text writer uh, would make a, a, an important economic claim, you know, argumentatively economic claim about a certain major issue, let's say, in logic. And it's almost an invitation, a prompt, for the commentary tradition, which is a living tradition around him, to take up this issue and to provide proofs, to critique, and so on and so forth. Sometimes within that one or two lines, you would have allusions to other problems that those who are part of the conversation know about, and they will pick it up. So one of the articles that I wrote about recently, uh, actually that I wrote recently, I think it was actually in fact about two years ago, so it's not so recent, is I take one particular lemma or one particular uh, short commented line in the openings of a logic text from the late 17th century, where uh, the, the lemma or the text is not even concerning logic. It's, a te it's the opening lines is, is a praise of God, and it says, uh, praise be God, la yutasawwaru wa la yuhaddu. He cannot be conceptualized and he cannot be defined. So it's a praise, right? You're opening, you open a state, you open a text with the praise of God and praise of Muhammad, and you say, Amma you know, and, and now that this is done, let me get to the topic. This particular line is ultimately considered to be, the, by the commentaries and gloss, glossators, to be very, very packed. It is a statement about what the nature of conceptualization is, what the nature of definitions are, whether extramental objects can ultimately be defined, whether extramental objects are like mental objects and so on. There are certain commentaries that go on for about 300 pages, taking up different philosophical issues and logical issues to comment on this one line. And this is no exaggeration. You can look, for example, at uh, Fadliha Kherabadi's gloss on the commentary of Qadi Mubarak on this text, Ulam al -Ulum. It's about 400 pages long, where this one line is treated for about 300 pages. Uh, so the point I'm trying to make is that these small comments in the base text, which seem to be rather innocuous and ultimately uninteresting, for those who are part of the conversation, whether it be in astronomy, or in logic and so on. For those who are part of it, it is an, a prompt, it's an allusion to something important. Uh, sometimes the way I describe these commentaries and gloss traditions is that it's almost as if walking, you're walking into an ongoing conversation in a coffee shop. You know, you've walked in, and if you're not part of that conversation, you would be ultimately lost, completely lost, until you sit there for a while and you read through, and you begin to pick up the hints. Uh, so, Science, to go back to what I was saying, science in the pre-modern Islamic tradition is something that's produced often in the commentaries uh, and the glosses. And you have, to, you have to read them against each other. Uh, the, another work that I'm just finishing up, a, a book on the same logic text, uh, there is one, there, the logic text from the late, late 17th century has about 90, 90 commentaries and glosses in the course of 200 years. This is how thick and dense that conversation was. <coughs> And by the end, if you look at it very closely, by the end of the train of conversations over decades, uh, and, and of course through the middle, you see a progress and development uh, of an argument going in new directions. Uh, this is why I think it's very important to realize that again, the question of progress and what Muslims contributed to science is also ultimately the wrong kind of question from our perspective. That question has to be embedded within the context of the text and the issues and the arguments that are part of the tradition. You know, did, did, the, you know, did the Muslim scholars accept the heliocentric theory? Um, uh, thank you. Did they accept the heliocentric uh, theory? Well, by, you know, by all accounts, largely, no, they, they did not. But to accept the heliocentric theory means, ultimately, for those who understand the tradition, it also mean overcoming a cosmology which was built in a very robust philosophical fashion. 
Uh, to accept the theory would also mean that you have accepted a tradition, let's say Copernicus, which actually, by the way, did not pr provide better predictive models, and it had its own problems, which were which had not, which did not resolve the concerns of the Muslims, right? So the question of heliocentrism and whether a certain kind of science and acceptance of this is is an indication of progress is the wrong kind of question. Is there progress within the conversations that are going on within the tradition? That's the right kind of question, which means you have to know the tradition and the commentaries and the glosses and so on and so forth. So that's the, uh, that's the other point I, I wanted to make. And I think the last thing I'll say is one of the things that I've noticed in, in, in the context of these commentaries and glosses, I, I mentioned this before, is that they become introspective. They take a particular topic and they begin to hypothesize the objects of, the particular, uh, of a particular discipline and start reflecting on them. So let me give you an example. Uh, in the logic text, and this, by the way, would again go back to what Professor Saliba was saying about mathematic, a certain mode of mathematical thinking, thinking through models. In a particular logic text uh, in the late 17th century, uh, a scholar, the, the scholar Muhibullah um, Bihari, begins to talk about whether the following proposition is true, uh, and I'll give the proposition in just one second, and if it is true, can you construct a whole science on its basis? The proposition is, if two is an odd number, then it is even. Uh, that, sorry, then it is a number. If, if two is odd, then it is a number, right? And I, and I suspect that all of you will say, yes, that's a true statement, right? If two is odd, then it is a number. It just so happens to be the case that two is not odd, but the proposition itself as a posit, as a hypothesis is correct. Similarly, he says, for example, if A and not A are both true at the same time, then I am both here and not here. Yes, that's a true statement. And in that context, then he begins to talk about how you construct, I mean, not, not very clearly, but his commentators and glossators talk about it, how you can construct a logic of impossible entities. Impossible entities that you can talk about not as extra mental objects because they don't exist. In fact, you can't even conceptualize impossible entities. But can you construct a whole logic on the posit of the propositions, hypothetical propositions about these impossible objects being true? Uh, for example, and there are paradoxes that emerge out of it. Uh, for example, you have a statement such as you know, the square circle is impossible to talk about, right? Uh, because it's something you cannot conceptualize. But in that very statement, you have talked about the square circle. Namely, you have said that it is impossible to talk about. And now you can construct on the basis of this posit an entirely you know, new logical system where all the posits are supporting the truth value of other posits. So these are the kinds of things that begin to happen within the complex of these commentaries. The last thing I'll say to connect it with Professor Saliba's talk is that in E.G., which is, uh, who is a theologian and uh, much else beside that in the Mawaqif, uh, there's a very similar idea that's, that's posited. Uh, he says, and uh, in fact, perhaps it's Jujani, his, one of his commentators that's talking about it. In, in that particular passage, he says that if you have a globe that is revolving, and you have a point at the equator and another point on uh, near the pole, then the point on the equator is going to be moving at a faster speed than the one on the, on the pole, right? Because it's covering a greater distance in the same time. Uh, there is nothing in the nature of this point itself, obviously, at either point that one should move faster than the other. But with the mathematical posit of a globe moving at a certain velocity and the points being posited in a certain locations, then given that posit and that hypothesis, certain mathematical truths are going to emerge, right? Uh, so this is, these are the points I'm trying to make that within the field of logic, because of this introspection and taking its objects on its own as hypothetical objects, and within the case of astronomy and, and mathematizing it and thinking of mathematical uh, astronomy through mathematical hypotheses, Muslim science through these internal conversations in the commentaries by self, by reflection of their own objects begins to progress. So to, to summarize, then, I, the two points, I, I know I've spoken in sort of a larger frame without giving you know, too many details, which we can talk about when we sit down. Uh, the two points I've tried to stress here is when we talk about Muslim science in the pre-modern world, we have to think about various disciplines that are interconnected. Uh, just astronomy or medicine and so on will not do. These are not disconnected things. And the second point is that when we talk about the progress of Muslim science, we have to think about it with respect to the specific notions of genres, such as commentaries, specific notions of authorship, originality, and so on, that are specific to that tradition. It's only then that it makes sense. So thank you very much for your attention.